Pharisees, who say there is no resurrection, came to Jesus and asked him a question. Teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies, leaving a wife but no children, the man shall marry the widow and raise up children for his brother. Now there were seven brothers, the first married and died childless, then the second and the third married her. And so in the same way, all seven died childless. Finally, the woman also died. In the resurrection, therefore, whose wife will the woman be? For the seven had married her. Jesus said to them, those who belong to this age marry and are given in marriage. But those who are considered worthy of a place in that age and in the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage. Indeed, they cannot die anymore because they are like angels and are children of God, being children of the resurrection. And the fact that the dead are raised, Moses himself showed in the story about the bush, where he speaks of the Lord as the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Now he is God not of the dead, but of the living, for to him all of them are alive. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. I'd like to invite any young children, folk, anybody under the age of 60 to, uh, you caught that, okay, to come on up and brave the stranger danger, and we'll sit for a while here and talk. Have a seat, folks. Now, I'm not going to sit down like I did last time, because I did a lot of yard work yesterday, and if I sit down, I definitely won't get back up, so. It is so good to see all of you this morning, oh, and you too. My name is Marty, and uh, I grew up in a Lutheran church just like you did. Um, for a long time, I was a member of a place called Hope Lutheran Church in Springfield, Ohio, which is miles and miles and miles away from here, but um, I always like to sit in church and think about God stuff. That's probably why I ended up being a pastor. And I like to think about holidays, too. It's all good. So what holiday are we going to be celebrating soon? Yes, sir. Veterans Day. Very good. We are actually celebrating that we're commemorating that this morning in church, but I think technically tom tomorrow is Veterans Day. So for many of us, this is a special time, especially those of us who are veterans or those of us who are related to veterans. Yes, sir. My grandpa was a veteran. Your grandpa was a veteran? That's wonderful. My dad was a veteran. He was a Marine who was in the Pacific during World War II. So we are very grateful for our veterans and thankful for what they have done, the service to their country. So what happens after Veterans Day? What holiday will we be looking at? Yes. Thanksgiving. Okay. Raise your hand if you like pumpkin pie. Really? Okay. I got to give you guys credit. Do you like pumpkin pie more than apple pie? Uh, okay. I'm not a big pumpkin pie fan. I know I'm going to make many people angry and they'll write letters to the pastor, but it's just, it's just an excuse to eat nutmeg, if you ask me. So, um, <laughs> but, but anyway, enjoy your pie. Enjoy the turkey and the stuffing and the mashed potatoes and everything like that. Let's see. So that's the, the, the next holiday. What's the holiday after that? Uh, you, sir. Sorry? Christmas. No, wait, no, wait a minute. Wait a minute. There's something in between Thanksgiving and Christmas, something that, oh yeah, your church is named for this, I believe. Yes, sir. Hanukkah? Well, <laughs> I would love to see a Hanukkah Lutheran church. That would, that would be the perfect celebration of all God's good gifts in our dappled diversity. But there is another holiday, a 25 days of Advent. Yes, these are 25 days where we focus 
not on the Christmas that's coming, although um, some of us can't help but think about it. I started listening to Christmas music yesterday. I know for some purists that's a problem, but I can't help myself. It's just that time of year. But Advent is its own special time, and during Advent, it's a 25, 24 days long celebration, and it begins on December 1st. Now, how many of you have an Advent calendar in your house? How many of you have an Advent calendar that opens the door and there's candy inside? Yeah, right? You guys know what's good. Okay. You don't have an Advent calendar with candy? Oh, well, you need to talk to your mom and dad, your grandma and grandpa. <laughs> They'll get with the program. I have a gift for all of you this morning. This is a different kind of Advent calendar. It's one that we put together at the seminary. It's called the Advent Star, and how it works is like this. Now, each of you are going to get one of these before you go back to your pew, but it is, oops, I accidentally pulled out two. This is a long, long piece of paper, and the way it works is you fold it like an accordion, just like this, and by the time you're done folding it, the service is over. No, the... Uh, <laughs> the shape of the paper will sit on your table next to an advent wreath and it will look like a star. See? Actually, there's a little piece of paper on the end that you're supposed to tear off and hand to your parents so they can make a gift to the seminary. But <laughs> was that subtle enough? Um, but when you tape it together, it turns into a star and on each part of the star, there's a scripture reading and a prayer for Advent. So you can celebrate Advent in your home. All right? So I want you all to have one of these as we move forward. And what a great place to celebrate Advent, a church named Advent Lutheran Church. Now, Advent is an interesting word. It is a word that helps us remember that Jesus is going to come back someday. And he's going to be with us forever and ever and ever. And to me, that is the best promise we can possibly have. So what better way to name a church than Advent Lutheran Church? Will you pray with me? Let's do a repeat after me prayer. I'm going to say some words and you say I'm up to God, okay? Dear God, thank you for our veterans, for Thanksgiving, for Advent, and Christmas. Thank you for the promise that you will be with us forever and ever. Amen. All right, now I'm going to ask you all to come up here and we'll reach in the bag and get you each one of these as you head back to your seat. How does that sound? And I brought enough for every family in the congregation as well. So, all right, don't be shy. Here we go. Maybe we can just take out a handful of these and we can start passing them around to our friends. Yeah, yeah, there we go. Take one and pass it on. Unless you want all of them, that's okay. Here, <laughs> whoops. Can I help you? Here, I'm gonna give you one. This worked better in rehearsal, folks. Here we go. You can have one. And you can head on back to your seat. Here we go, Rebecca. All right. Here. Thank you all so much for coming up and talking about the holidays. You, sir, are going to be a pastor someday, I can tell. <laughs> and I'm very, and you too, by the way. Grandpa is a pastor. Yeah. <laughs> that explains a lot. Yeah. There we go. And one last but not least. Great. All right. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. I'm just going to put these on the pew here. So that way, if anybody else wants one after worship, they're here. But don't take my Trader Joe's bag.
I am impressed to see so many children at the early service. I don't know what you're doing, but you're doing something good. So, I have a child. I have two children, actually. I guarantee you that they are both asleep as we speak. Uh, the interesting thing about being the children of two pastors is when two pastors travel on Sunday mornings, often they get the morning off. Now, my son Seth is in college, so I don't know what he does on Sundays. I try not to think about it. Um, but I do have a teenage daughter named Chelsea who's in high school, and she and I go to church together or, and with her mother, Angela, whenever we are able to, uh, to have a Sunday off, and we'll go uh, usually to a little church called Trinity near Arentsville. It's a beautiful little church up there in Apple Orchard Country. If any of you sent kids to Camp Nawakwa last summer, um, chances are they met my daughter. She worked in the craft hall. She's very creative. She's also a master negotiator. She can quote me to myself going back about a decade, you know? <laughs> Anything I have ever said to her or promised her, she files it away, and she can bring it up at a moment's notice. Like many adolescents, she tends to live by the letter of the law instead of the spirit of the law. And when she asks for something, she will argue with me using a lot of really interesting logic. Based, of course, mostly on how we treated her older brother back in the day, or how other parents are relating to their kids. Well, Annie has the new iPhone, you know. Julia gets writing lessons. Martha is going to France next year. <clears throat> How can I, her father, deny her these essential things, you know? And then she brings on that charm offensive, you know, and I have to steal my nerves and my heart so as not to be manipulated into whatever scheme she has put together. She's not a bad kid. She's simply learning how to make her way in the world, which means sometimes I say yes and sometimes no. And when she asks me why I say no, most of the time my only recourse is to say because I'm the dad, that's why. I mean, can I get a witness, anyone? <laughs> okay, thank you. The Sadducees are a lot like an adolescent daughter. They approach Jesus with the idea of testing him to see if they can force him to agree with them, their particular way of thinking about stuff. Or maybe they want to discredit his teachings by virtue of a theological technical foul. They create this case study that sounds ludicrous to our ears. A woman is married to seven brothers, one at a time, because they all die and leave her destitute without children. So when they all get to heaven, to whom will she be married? Bachelor number one, bachelor number two, and so forth and so on. Jesus could have said, this is a stupid question. And you all don't deserve an answer because I am Jesus, that's why. But instead, he chooses to engage with them, knowing full well what their real agenda is all about. He engages with them even though they are theologically, politically, and most likely socioeconomically different from him in so many ways. Instead of blowing them off, Jesus reaches across the divide and meets them on their own turf. And his answer is fascinating and mysterious to all of us. It might help here to acknowledge a few facts about the Sadducees. As the text tells us, they don't even believe in the resurrection. They also only believe that the Pentateuch, or the first five books of the Old Testament, are the sacred texts from God. Everything else is not. They also create this scenario because of something called Leverite marriage, which comes from the law given to Moses, stating that a dead man's brother is morally obligated to marry his widowed sister-in-law so that she will not be childless. Because as it says in scripture, women will be saved through childbearing. Okay, we'll just leave that there. 
Jesus knows exactly what the Sadducees are up to. He knows their beliefs, their customs, and their hearts. And he offers a glimpse of what the resurrection is all about. We are to exist in such a way where earthly relationships are superseded by an awesome awareness of our intimate connection to God and all living things. And we will see each other for who and what we are and understand how we are inextricably intertwined in the fabric of God's wonderful story, a sacred, endless tapestry of beginnings and endings that never end. But first, the Sadducees need to know about this poor woman who married seven guys, all of whom expired on her watch. Hmm. <laughs> it hardly seems like a fair question to ask our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, but then again, they aren't aware of his divinity. He's just another Johnny come lately, you know? They simply know that he is saying and doing things that are threatening the establishment of which they are a part, and they want to take him down a few notches so that they can keep their social status intact. Which begs the question, what question would we ask Jesus if we had the chance? Would we have the audacity to put him to the test so as to reassure our station in life? The Sadducees are afraid of losing their power. What are we afraid of? Death? Taxes? The never-ending news cycle of political drama? What would we say to Jesus if he popped up here in the room? Would we try to negotiate a better deal with this life? A new iPhone or a better job or a trip to France? Would we ask him about human tragedy and suffering? Would we ask all those classic theological questions of why there is evil in the world? Or how many angels can dance on the head of a pin? Or perhaps whether or not God can make a rock that is so heavy that even God can't lift it? Those are the kind of questions I hear students ask at the seminary all the time when they're avoiding the really important stuff about how to love and serve their neighbors. If we could ask Jesus anything, what would we ask? Well, let's do that now, shall we? Let's take a moment to silently meditate and ask the questions. Don't worry, I'll keep the time for you. Let's pray silently to God. Amen. Now, I'm not sure what questions you asked Jesus just now, or even if you stuck with Jesus this whole time. Maybe you started thinking about your grocery list or something. That's okay. I'm not sure that you're going to get an answer in the manner in which you prefer to hear it. We may not even be comfortable with how and when Jesus gives us an answer. But if this text from Luke tells us anything, it is that we can count on the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, and the resurrection to life everlasting. Moreover, if a widow happens to be married to seven brothers and they all meet up in God's resurrection, whether or not she's married to one of, or all of them won't even matter. No matter how complicated we think we can make this life, the promise of the resurrection is so simple that we can't get it. That all wounds will be healed, all earthly complications resolved, and all relationships made sacred in a way that is beyond our comprehension or understanding. Can we dare to imagine that? 
to be like the angels, to live in God's presence, to live without fear of dying, or in your case, in fear of not having the right photo for your obituary. I don't know about you, but I have a difficult time wrapping my head around these wonderful ideas. I hope and pray that God will be patient with us and steer us past our confusion and fear and doubts into the place where the power of the resurrection will no longer be a mystery for any of us, but an experience that we can share together forever. Believe in the power of resurrection. And here's a bit of a reminder for you. My memory isn't what it used to be, so... A few thousand years from now, when we are gathered together in our eternal home, could you remind me that we had this conversation this morning? Can you remind me of this memory of our time of fellowship and worship together as we celebrate with our brothers and sisters of every race and tribe, every folk and nation at a feast that will have no end? I look forward to seeing you there. Amen. Jimmy, Jimmy, Jimmy.